Um, welcome to your city hall and to the District 8 Budget Town Hall. Councilwoman Kelly Allen Gray, and I am delighted to uh, see you all here. Um, and to those who are watching on Facebook Live and the city's channel, um, welcome to the uh, budget overview. We're going to talk about our city's budget as well as the CCPD uh, budget. And um, so we're going to have, starting off, we're going to have our city manager, David Cook, who will present the budget, and then our chief, uh, our police chief, Ed Krause, who will come behind him. We'll do questions in between. Um, for those who are watching, there's a phone number on the screen, so you can text in your questions, or you can also call in, and we will ask those questions during question and answer time. So want to be respective of everybody's time. So let's get started. And I'll turn it over to our city manager, David Cook. Thank you, Council Member Kelly Allen Gray. But it's evening now, right? Good evening, everybody. I'm David Cook, the city manager, and I'm going to give an overview of the city's budget at a pretty high level, because I know we want to get to questions and also talk about the CCPD budget. Back in February, when we worked with the uh, City Council, we set up a number of goals. Uh, and again, it's a very different period of time from February to now, and I'll talk about some of those changes. But some of our goals as we go through the budget process, the first one is maintain or reduce the property tax rate. As property values have been going up dramatically, the City Council has been reducing the property tax rate to but I'll say minimize the impact on property owners. And I think we've needed to reduce the property tax rate to become more competitive from a business standpoint as well. The second goal is to maintain funding for capital investment and maintenance. So one of the first things we have to decide in a budget is how much money should we set aside to maintain the stuff that we've already built, like libraries and rec centers and roads and parks and so forth. How much money do we need to set aside for new infrastructure like roads and parks because we still are growing at 15 to 20,000 people a year. So when you think about that, every year we add nearly 100,000 people. And I'd have you think about the infrastructure that's needed for a town or city of 100,000. And we've got to do that every five or six years. That's why we have bond programs. We're thankful that citizens have approved bond programs in 2014, 2018, and now we're planning for the bond program for right now, plan for 2022. Uh, the third goal relates to, as we go to the bond programs and we ask citizens to vote for whether it's a new fire station or library or park, when we build those things, we have to operate them and maintain them. So we have obligations that come with building those bond projects. We also have contracts with fire through the collective bargaining agreement, and we have contract with the meet and confer for police officers. The fourth goal uh, is implementing the recommendations from the task force on race and culture and looking at equity and city services. In the current year that we're in, we started the implementation of those recommendations. We carry those over to the second year, and I can address some of those as well. Goal number five uh, is about looking at how we fund police and the CCPD funding. I'll leave most of that for Chief Krause when he talks about the CCPD budget. And then goal number six is really the reality of where we are now. I think we have to be thinking about preparing for fewer resources in the next couple years as we work through the economic impact of the pandemic. Real quick, this is just to talk first about taxable values in Fort Worth. So if you look at the far left number, that's the current year taxable value of all the property in the city of Fort Worth. Now, two things happen to grow that tax base or decrease that tax base. First is we look at all the existing values and whether they go up or down. So when you see that change in net taxable or net taxable going up by 378 million, that's only a half a percent. That's the lowest 
increase in current values in at least the last six to eight years. Right? So that's not growing very much. Thankfully, we've got a lot of new developments still under construction, but that value is going up, and that's 2.5 billion in new development put on the ground. That gives us a three and a quarter percent. So of the property tax base growing by less than 4%, that's the smallest growth in the tax base in probably the last six to eight years as well. So this is a budget that's going to get tighter, and there's not going to be the amount of property tax dollars we thought available. So the recommendation for the next year's budget is to keep the property tax rate the same. And so this is just how we break out the property tax rate. Overall, it's 74 and three quarter cents. And this is where we get into how much do we set aside for capital, infrastructure, that's the debt. So we debt finance some of the infrastructure. And then when you look at the O&M, some of that money goes for programs and services. And some of it goes to maintain some of the capital infrastructure that we have and some maintenance responsibilities. And we use cash to pay for that. So we don't debt finance a lot of our maintenance. Uh, we debt finance building new infrastructure. Tell me what to point at. There we go. This is just uh, a depiction of taxable value, gross total assessed value, and revenue over a longer period of time. And all I'll point out is the line is getting flatter and the increase year over year before was greater. Um, now to the total budget. This is operating, and this includes now all the different businesses that uh, I talked about before. So this is our water, this is stormwater, it's our parking, it's solid waste, and it's the general fund. So we spend every year $1.8 billion in the operating budget. This budget is less than a half a percent larger than the current year. So there's really not a lot of growth going on from one year to the next in the operating budget, yet we're still going to grow in population 15 to 20,000 people. How about if I say next? Oh, there we go. Now let's just focus on the general fund, which is going to be 1.5% higher than the current year budget. And this is to show the property tax makes up most of the revenue, sales tax, sales tax, another 23%. So when you think of property and sales tax, that makes up roughly 79% of all the money in the general fund. Next, uh, the second goal that we talked about before was maintaining funding for capital investment and maintenance. And since we're keeping the tax rate the same and the tax base is growing a little bit, we're maintaining our current level of investment for both those things. And some of that uh, that we fund also includes the neighborhood improvement strategy that we've been doing for the last four years. Uh, and then we are planning for the 2022 bond program. We will open new facilities this year. Thank you very much. Uh, Golden Triangle Library actually opened, I think, on Tuesday. We're going to open the Reba Carey Library at the end of next fiscal year. We have the Far North Animal Shelter, new parks, and we have their meet and confer and collective bargaining. And all this, again, is intended to restate that if we're going to build these new facilities, the new infrastructure, new assets for the community, 
we have to pay to maintain them once we open them. Uh, the goal four about the Race and Culture Task Force. Uh, we've had money in this year's budget in transportation and public works. We put money in there to support more infrastructure and maintenance investments in parts of the city where we have more people of color. So when you look at street lights or Maintenance of roads, there was more money in this year's budget to do it in certain areas of the city, and that's going to continue. One of the things we're looking at is, is our level of investment, our level of maintenance, our levels of service equitably delivered in the city of Fort Worth. Not equally delivered, equitably delivered. And that's a focus of the city and what the Race and Culture Task Force also pointed out. The current year budget, we started the police monitor function out of the city manager's office, and we're enhancing it in the upcoming budget. And we're continuing to do the neighborhood improvements in that neighborhood improvement program. Our, one of the recommendations from the Race and Culture Task Force was to create this, uh, our new department we have in the city is called Diversity and Inclusion. That department will be working with all of the other businesses, departments in the city to create equity plans to make sure we're doing what I just said, that we're investing, maintaining, and providing services equitably throughout the city. Going back to the other businesses in the city, uh, these we call them enterprise funds. They operate more like a business. They charge rates. So there's no public, there's no, well, that's not public, there's no general fund or property tax, sales tax in these operations. But you probably see these on your water bill. If you get a water bill, that's the biggest. We have a stormwater fee, that'll be on your water bill. We have solid waste, that'll be on your water bill. And then we also run airports and parking. All these businesses that make up 600 so million are going, growing up by less than 1%. One of the issues that the council will be wrestling with is on the solid waste fund. And we need to make it sustainable over a long period of time. We have, actually have a work session with the city council tomorrow, and this will be one of the topic items, and it's how do we make that fund sustainable over a long period of time. One of the challenges is that the residential fee is paying for almost the entirety of the fund, but it's a fund that provides services not just for residents of the city of Fort Worth. Jumping to special revenue funds, uh, the two largest I'll just talk about a little bit. CCPD, I won't spend a lot of time, that's predominantly a half cent sales tax. Uh, but the Culture and Tourism Fund is our next largest. And I want you to think about, so this is what funds Will Rogers, what funds the Convention Center, and most of that revenue stream comes from hotel tax revenue. So what has happened to hotel tax revenue since March? It has plummeted. And so that fund is another topic for tomorrow so that we all understand how much that fund has tanked and what do we need to do to react to the drop in when you think about ticket tax, hotel tax, and so forth. I'm going to skip this one because you're going to get a whole presentation on it. Oop. Then the final goal, and just to think about it, and that's about preparing for a few resources. The city has had a hiring freeze in place since March. As soon as we asked people to stay home, we knew revenues were going to be impacted, and we've had a revenue, um, excuse me, a hiring freeze in place. We are reducing positions in the city of Fort Worth to bring our workforce cost in line with the new revenue picture. We're going to continue to review service levels and positions throughout the next year. I think next year, 
when we're doing a budget will be harder than this year. And I'd have you think about it this way. We know what the property tax values are for the upcoming budget year. I've shown you that. They they're still grow by less than 4%. But if you're an owner of a hotel, you're an owner of an office space that now has more vacancy. If you're an owner of retail space that is now not occupied. If you're an owner of a restaurant that is no longer operating or a bar, I believe that those owners of those spaces are going to be able to describe that the value of those properties should go down. Not as much worried about residential values, but I think there's a chance that, act, that commercial values actually go down next year when we're trying to prepare. So back in February, we showed the council that blue line. That looks good. I think we'll be dealing more with uh, what the red line might look like. And so that, we have to react a little bit differently as we talk about this year's budget and next year's budget going forward. Sales tax took a dive in March. It's actually been starting to come back. And so actually our June sales tax numbers were higher than even the previous year. So I think the sales tax was a drop off for a while, but I think it's coming back next week. We did reduce 50 net positions in the city one year to the next. Some departments are on both sides, so they're adding positions and subtracting positions. Uh, but overall, it's a net reduction of 50 positions. This is just, again, covering those uh, six goals that we had in the budget. And I think I have some slides on the capital real quick. Right? Next. So each year, we talk about capital, and that's infrastructure. So think about roads, parks, libraries, fire stations. And we plan it out over multiple years, because you can't think about capital in one-year increments. You have to think about it over a longer period of time. So every year, we do a five-year capital plan, and we update it each year. Next, please. Mostly, it's funded either from cash-like stuff. So we want to pay for infrastructure with both debt and cash. And this just gives you an idea of how we pay for those things. Um, the tax rate, if you remember for the debt and the pay as you go, which is cash, stayed the same. So we're keeping our level of, of investment constant year over year. Um, and one of the things we also show the council every February is, here's what our debt capacity looks like over time. So when we think about the next bond program, how big or small can that be based on a set of assumptions? So we've now updated the debt capacity with our current realities. I think that's coming next. So in February, we told the city council, based on the former assumptions, that we could do probably $750 million in debt without raising taxes. With just those assumptions that we've changed based on that red line versus the blue line, we've lost $250 million in debt capacity. So it has a huge impact because it's a compounding effect over time when you change. So when we show the capital improvement plan, again, it's for all our businesses. And the general CIP, they compete for the same dollars. But water has got its own infrastructure needs and a way to finance it. Stormwater has its own way to pay for its infrastructure and finance it. But the point I just want to share is the next slide. We spend nearly three to four hundred million every year on the infrastructure for all these different businesses. And you see the general plan. And that number is about 100 million a year. That's mostly roads, okay? road maintenance. Think about water, which is the largest capital plan. That's for all the water and sewer lines that are being extended or replaced. It's the uh, new wastewater treatment plants or water plants that have to be built. And again, the point simply being that infrastructure is a big component of our budget each and every year. Uh, 
the city of Fort Worth is over 900,000 in population, and I'd have you think about and adding 100,000 every five to six years. Infrastructure needs that also drive the things that we talk about in the budget. And that might be it. Oh, the, the budget meeting's coming up. Uh, some of these we've already checked off. We have a budget meeting on CCPD with the uh, City Council next Tuesday. We have public hearings on the budget. The first one will be on September 1st. Second one on September 15th. And if all goes well, the City Council will adopt the budget on the 22nd of September. That concludes my part and be glad to answer any questions. We have a few people who signed up to ask questions and if you could wait till you get the microphone so that we can um, we can hear it. The first person the first person is Mr. Lopez. Hello, my name is uh, Ramiro Lopez. I'm at 1704 Oakland Boulevard and I was just talking about the, the parks as a point for both mental and physical uh, wellness during this COVID time. And I live to where I can see the park from my house, but the bridge has been closed on Oakland Park for about s over six months. And it's, my wife doesn't feel safe there, so we go come to Trinity Park and take our, my daughter uh, there. Uh, but I'd just like to see more resources put in the, the local parks that we already have. And we, we love it, it's close, but like I said, with we just don't feel safe and comfortable there. Thank you for that comment. I, I do want to I do think the council believes the parks are important. They're a big component of each bond program. The council has also approved moving forward with what we're going to call an open space plan. How do we protect more open spaces so people can also enjoy those? And we had our first purchase in that open space program, Broadcast Hill. I, it had to come to me. But so I do believe there's a, a agreement with your thought there that we ought to be doing more parks and open space. Next is Mr. Hostler. Well, I didn't think you'd get to me this quickly, but um, <laughs> um, I, my comment uh, is I'm good, directed at uh, Kelly, and uh, this goes back to about a year ago, and I, I know all things considered, uh, when you talk about budgets and the impact that pandemics have on those kinds of things. Uh, regardless, I think we still need to be concerned about the quality of life that uh, we have here in Fort Worth. And uh, if we want tax res revenue, then I think we need to continue to look towards the future uh, in making Fort Worth a place that people want to come back to and live and not leave. And to think we don't have that problem is um, would be inaccurate. So um, what I'm going to ask you about uh, is not the thing that I would expect to go to the top of the list of priorities when we have big, serious problems that uh, are very important to solve. Uh, but uh, it's in regards to uh, Meadowbrook Golf Course. I live uh, in north central Meadowbrook uh, down the street and uh, have been involved with that golf course uh, since I was 10 years old. And uh, I still play. Uh, I'm 65 years old and I play to a one handicap. I am an advocate and a supporter of municipal golf and uh, of Fort Worth municipal golf because if you go back in our history, um, the reason Fort Worth was a great place to live, it was very family friendly, very kid friendly. And civic leaders back decades ago said they wanted to bring golf to the masses. They didn't want it to be an elitist activity. They wanted, regardless of where you were on the socioeconomic ladder, you could have access to this great game. And what we've got at uh, Meadowbrook is it's, it landmarks that particular uh, part of the city. And top of that, it's, it's historic. And you wouldn't know that unless you were sort of involved in the game. But uh, it was uh, 
uh, from a golf perspective, it's a it's a uh, a diamond in the rough to coin a phrase, and I, I think it's been ignored for far too long in terms of its value to Fort Worth and what it could mean uh, not only to our neighborhood in the community but to Fort Worth uh, as a place that would make people want to come to live or, or visit. Kelly, you said uh, about uh, a little over a year ago, I happened to uh, catch uh, a work session on video because I was interested in the gaming issue. But also on the agenda was uh, you were talking about Sycamore Golf Course and what was going to be done with that. Uh, were you going to close the course? Uh, it turns out that that's what's happened. It was probably a good decision because um, I think David Creek was the fellow's name, uh, pointed out that th th that golf course had lost $4 million over its history and uh, it was time to do something else. Um, my question is, is there anything in the future for, for Meadowbrook? Because to quote you, you said, you know, if I'm going to agree to close Sycamore, then we're going to need to see some improvement over here at Meadowbrook because we can't have the Taj Mahal Rockwood across town and have what we have over here. It needs to be equitable. So long-winded up to my question, is there anything in the future for, for Meadowbrook Golf Course in terms of renovating that course and, and bringing it up to a standard that uh, uh, the city can be proud of. So let me start and then uh, I'll let the council members jump right in. So I'll tell you that, just remind that in the 2014 bond program was the redo of Rockwood. In the 2018 bond program was the clubhouse for Rockwood. We are now preparing the 2022 bond program and I know Meadowbrook is one of those projects that is being prioritized within the Parks and Recreation Program to see if it shows up on the next bond program. Now what will happen is we will go to the community after we get that list of projects and get community input to see what gets on the final list of projects for the 2022 bond program. Yes, there's a conversation about it. We're a year or so away from finalizing it, but I would say I would encourage you to stay involved and there will be public meetings to vet those projects. We're good, not unless you have something else you want me to say. Thank you. Okay, we've had some questions come in through um, text and on Facebook. The first one, um, will the city be funding transit at 100% I'm a restaurant owner and my employees need reliable transit service. Uh, let me start with tomorrow we'll talk about transit. The Trinity Metro made a request from the city for an additional <laughs> $10 million over the current fiscal year. We currently provide some funding to Trinity Metro and the amount of money that's in the recommended budget for next year is the same amount that's in this year. So it is not funded at the level requested by Trinity Metro. Okay, we have um, two questions from the Glen Park Neighborhood Association. Will more money be put into funding bus stops in the neighborhoods that need benches and shelters? Some of the funding that is in our budget for uh, Trinity Metro relates to sidewalks, bus stops, and I'm looking for you. bus stops, sidewalks, ADA improvements. So some of that money is in the budget to improve that uh, bus stops and sidewalks. Um, these, this next question has to do with the police monitor program. Um, First, thank you for the live feed on Facebook. When is the Enhanced Police Monitor Program going to roll out, and what is the budget for that? Uh, let me do it this way. So in the current year's budget, we started with two positions. Monitor, who's Kim Neal, and has been with us since March. 
Um, we had such a great applicant pool that we talked another person from that pool to joining us. So we actually found a way to add three into the current year. So Kim and Denise, who are the two people doing the police monitor function right now, are doing a number of things. One, they're working with the police department and setting up procedures and also evaluating policies. Setting up a consistent, uh, we'll call it a complaint system, so it doesn't matter where a complaint goes, they're all being reviewed by the police monitor function. He's also done a survey of the community and a survey within the police department. And he's compiling those now and we'll share those, I think, sometime by the end of September, if not before. In the next year's budget are two additional positions to help out that office. So that office will go from three to five. And again, it's an office that will still evolve. And as they identify staffing needs along the way because of what workload requirements or demands put on that office, then we'll look at additional staffing over time. I would like to, to add too that um, on the city's website, we have our Gov Delivery newsletter. And one of the subjects that people can now sign up for is the police monitor office if they want to get regular updates from that staff. So I would encourage them to do that as well. Um, this is a, a really a comment to increase funding for after school programs. They're, more, they're needed more now to respond to the COVID-19 challenges. Um, how do people find out more about neighborhood improvement programs and when will the funding be announced for next year? Uh, I would encourage, if you're interested in the neighborhood improvement program, to contact our neighborhood services department. They're the ones that administer that program. And we usually make that assessment and announcement, I want to say, in November, December time frame. Let me address the after school program. There's more money in the CCPD program for after school programs. The chief might cover that. We also, we also talked today about using CARES Act funding to help with after school programs at rec centers and neighborhood centers. There are a few more um, Trinity Metro comments, but um, with the update tomorrow, I think a lot of those questions will be answered. Um, and then I think someone from Parks sent in a comment, the Meadowbrook Golf Course Irrigation Pump House was replaced this year with, at a total cost of $390,000. Those are all the questions I have right now. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> we are going to uh, welcome our police chief, Ed Kraus, um, to come and talk about the CCPD budget. And then if you can give me your email information, will you please allow me to send you the information on Fostick Dam and everything that's going on um, around Oakland Park? We'd like to do that. So I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, Chief Krause, and thank you, David. And oh, before I do this, oh, while they're still getting ready, let me say thank you to all of the city staff um, who is here. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Um, and to the marshals and to uh, Chief Aldridge, who, who is here, I just appreciate you all taking time out of your, of your evening and coming to spend this evening with us so that we can make sure that the citizens of Fort Worth actually know what's going on. So thank you. Thank you. As um, the CCPD came up for election this year, we got a lot of questions um, with the national narrative going on, local narrative going on uh, about defunding police and what that means. Uh, we had a lot of uh, inquiries about why can't you fund this instead of what you're funding. Um, and what we realized, a lot of people didn't realize what we were funding with the CCPD. So as we looked at proposing a budget for the next fiscal year, um, what we wanted to do was highlight exactly um, what programs are in there and to make a clear delineation between what are more traditional policing programs and what are the enhancements offered through the CCPD. So uh, we put a 
40 of our community-based services into CCPD and out of the general fund and more of our traditional police services into the general fund. Um, we reduced budgets for equipment and enhanced enforcement because we were able to and increased budgets for crime prevention, uh, recruitment training, community partnerships. Uh, take this opportunity to expand some successful programs and create some new ones. So the CCPD is made up of five funding categories or initiatives, uh, enhanced enforcement, we'll go through all these in more detail in just a minute, neighborhood crime prevention, partners with a shared mission, recruitment and training, equipment, technology, and infrastructure. Um, you can see on the slide here, uh, last year's uh, adjusted budget and uh, the proposed budget for fiscal year 20. Reduction in overall uh, funding because of the reduction in sales tax. Some of the new or expanded programs is our crisis intervention teams. This is a program we started a couple years ago. It's a dual response model or co-responder model where one of our officers who's trained as a mental health peace officer and has ex expanded training in that field teams up with a mental health provider and they go out and answer calls for people in mental distress and they also do follow-ups, uh, follow-up visits with people who have been in mental distress, uh, make sure those individuals are taking their medications, have access to their medications, have access to their doctors and that they are uh, getting the help that they need. One of the other issues or one of the other programs we want to start is a uh, community service professionals program, a crime response unit, if you will, uh, made up of members from the community that go out and answer nonviolent calls in the community, uh, thereby freeing up a police officer to be on, available for more emergency calls. Um, one of the things that was brought up just a, a moment ago uh, in, at the end of David's presentation with the question was expansion hours or after school programs, that, into, that uh, initiative falls under the partners with a shared mission and we are increasing that and our components within that are going to get a contract increase by 15% and then we also a lot more funding uh, to be available through uh, competitive uh, solicitation. Crisis intervention team I talked about just a moment ago. We currently have one team of six officers, a corporal and a sergeant uh, the, to do that work. Uh, they were housed in the general fund that allowed only for day shift coverage Monday through Friday. Um, what we are uh, proposing is to expand that to two teams of 10 each, eight officers, a corporal and a sergeant. Um, again, paired with a mental health professional uh, that allow us to coverage seven days a week throughout two shifts. We have the capacity to build out the third shift, um, third of our three shifts is the overnight shift, and um, you know, that's where the program will be able to expand it. Um, some of the other things we're doing with mental health uh, is to partner with a local foundation that's agreed to fund all of our officers getting trained up as mental health peace officers and certified as such, um, give them training so if they have to respond to somebody in mental crisis, they'll be better suited to answer calls. Creating a mental health advisory board with some nonprofits and some service providers to help guide us in our policy and how we respond to those calls. Our goal is actually to um, get guidance on which calls we can divert from ever coming to the police department, divert to those service providers. Um, but we want to give the professionals uh, the opportunity to get into crisis and not the police officers. Get out of the business because there are going to be calls where people have weapons or crisis and they need a police response. Um, so that we can divert that and that they can be given. And then when we encounter somebody with mental uh, health crisis that requires police interaction, right now we have a one option and that is uh, if we can't get them health service provider, we have to take them to the with uh, partnering with Tarrant County and some of the area agencies as a <coughs> third alternative, which is to take them to a health crisis diversion center where there's that, that location is staffed with professionals and, and doctors that can give them the help they need. 
kind of somebody who's involved in a low-level offense, um, nonviolent offense, will be able to or instead of taking him. Okay, happy to. Uh, the community response unit that I talked about is the, the pilot program of 10, 10 uh, non-sworn employees that are going to answer calls in the community. Um, there are several similar programs in several different cities, uh, but the kind of calls they would respond to are report calls where the suspect's not on scene anymore, uh, loose livestock, welfare checks, stranded motorists, uh, abandoned property, that kind of thing. Uh, we have a large number of those priority three and four calls that come in. They tend to sit in the queue for a long time because more urgent calls come requiring a, the response of a police officer. So these calls can hold for uh, some of, some for several hours uh, while officers deal with emergency calls. This program here would allow us to deal with these calls in a quicker fashion and also keep the police officers available for emergency calls and to work their beats as the beat officers we want them to be. So to accomplish some of the stuff we're talking about, moving the, uh, the softer programs, the enhanced programs into CCPD and the other more traditional programs into the general fund, these, uh, the numbers in parentheses are the number of full-time employees that are actually moving between the two funds. So the uh, SWAT, the criminal tracking unit, and the special response teams on the left are moving into the general fund. And the CCPD additions are the crisis intervention team, uh, some, some of our uh, administrators of community programs, uh, our bike units, and the cadet program, which we started this past year, is a recommendation from the Race and Culture Task Force. And that is uh, hiring young people in a part-time position as a pipeline to get them into the police department, also get them familiar with the police department. And the, uh, the top program there is the HOPE, or the homeless team. Uh, that homeless outreach team has been uh, established uh, for about a year and a half now, and it has uh, shown great promise in the homeless corridor, especially in dealing with people who are uh, in, uh, camping out in the open, people who are experiencing homelessness, and they're able to direct them to services. Uh, we started a partnership with our fire department where they put a paramedic with our officer and a mental health uh, service provider to deal with those individuals, and it's been very successful and very well received in the homeless community. So the different five funding initiatives, uh, we'll go through those quickly here. The uh, enhanced enforcement is uh, what we just talked about, moving the personnel from SWAT, uh, criminal tracking unit, SRT, out of the CCPD and into the general fund. Those are the first three blue highlighted uh, categories. And then at the bottom, uh, the bike units are moving into the CCPD since they are a softer unit. Um, and also the COPS hiring grant match. Um, as uh, Mr. Cook pointed out, we are not able to do a lot of hiring right now. Uh, the uh, matrix staffing study that was uh, completed in January 2019 indicated that we had a long way to go to hire up to the number of officers needed for the size of our city and to provide the service levels our uh, residents are accustomed to. Uh, they said we need 157 officers immediately with an additional 181 in the next decade. Um, because of COVID, we are simply unable to fund that, um, what we had started last year, which was a hiring of 35 officers. Um, we're not able to, to accom accommodate that this year. Um, but we were able to leverage a uh, United States Department of Justice COPS hiring grant to hire 13. Uh, that has been approved by the council, and so we will be hiring 13 officers, and uh, it's not 35, but it's a lot better than nothing. A neighborhood crime prevention is the next funding initiative. Uh, we moved a lot of the uh, programs, the crisis intervention team, the homeless team, um, and then that new uh, group of uh, civilian response unit office or civilian stands or the non-emergency calls all moving into CCPD. Partners with a shared mission. So this is the, the one dealing with the after school program and some of the other uh, programs like that that we fund. Um, each of the funding uh, categories up here uh, 
got a 15% bump. They hadn't had an increase in many years. Um, so we decided to increase each of those uh, standing partnerships, the After School Program, Alliance for Children, Coming Up Gang Intervention, Crime Prevention Agency, Family Justice Center, all with a 15% increase. Uh, the line item second to bottom that says Program Expansion and Enhancement is a program we started last year. Uh, Mr. Cook allowed us to put a quarter million dollars into the, the budget last year, designated specifically for a, a new program to fight violent crime. Um, it was actually recommended by Council Member Gray. Uh, that program has uh, been developed as uh, VIP Fort Worth, Violence Intervention Program Fort Worth, um, and they deal specifically with intervening with um, individuals who are likely to be involved in shootings either as a victim or as a suspect. Um, that project is up and running and we're increasing it based on the performance this year by 15% also. Um, so they're getting an increase in their program as well. The highlighted program is community-based programs. That is an initiative where we solicit uh, programs through an RFP process. Those programs can uh, request funding through the C CCPD um, to get their programs up and running and off the ground. Uh, it has been, funding for that has been stuck at uh, $250,000 for many, many years. Um, what we realize is there are a lot of programs that can't apply for that because they can't get the funding stream. They need to either make their uh, program sustainable over a couple years or that they need more than the uh, $50,000 we generally give each program each year. So we're increasing that from 250,000 to two million dollars. Recruitment and training is a, one of the funding programs uh, that we are actually decreasing, um, and that's not because we're not needing to recruit more officers. It, we simply are only having one recruit class planned for this fiscal year. Uh, the current fiscal year, we ran four classes through. Uh, three of those are still in session now, but most of the funding for those has already been paid for. So we're having to run one recruitment class um, in fiscal year 2021. There may be an opportunity or a need to run a second class to keep up with attrition. But since we're not expanding the number of officers on the department, we do not have to uh, fund a, a full recruit officer training program. Equipment tech and infrastructure is where we put most of the equipment for the police officers, including vehicles. Um, there's some significant funding decreases in this category, which allow us to increase the programs in the prior, prior funding initiatives. Uh, the first highlighted line is technology infrastructure program. We are decreasing that by $2 million. One of that is a $1 million one-time IT uh, decrease that we do not need for capital projects. Um, the other million dollars is simply taking the money out of there and putting it into the uh, citywide camera program, creating an, its own initiative because of that. Um, that is a program that has proven to be very successful. We want to take that out, make it its own line item so we can better report on, on the success that we're having with that and needs to increase or decrease the number of cameras in the city. Facility requirement program is $2.4 million uh, that we've been paying for each of the last five years to help fund the uh, building of the Bob Bolin Public Safety Complex on the south side of town. Uh, we took a loan out from the Solid Waste uh, Department uh, for $10 million and uh, have paid that back each of the five, last five years. Uh, that loan is now satisfied, so going into this year and future years, we do not have to pay that back. Our high mileage vehicle program is decreasing. Um, that is mainly due to the fact that our fleet is in such good shape right now. It's in the best shape uh, I've ever seen in my 28 years and we're able to uh, not need to replace the high mileage vehicles quite as often. This is just the uh, proposed budget by category. Salaries and benefits make up the most uh, the big bulk of the uh, money that comes in through the CCPD um, services, equipment and utilities, uh, repairs make up a, a big chunk of that as well.
So there you go. Got some questions. All right. Okay. What is the benefit purpose of switching funds from CCPD budget to the general fund? Just, just putting more traditional services into the general fund, just because we had so many questions about what CCPD funded and uh, a lack of knowledge of some of the enhanced services that are provided by CCPD by switching them. And we're not able to put all traditional services into general fund. It, ideally, we, I think we would put vehicles uh, in there too because they're essential, police, essential to police services. But I think it, it better delineates what is a traditional police service and what is an enhancement provided by CCPD. Um, I believe you already spoke to this, but um, will the VIP program that Pastor McIntosh proposed last Friday be funded? Yes, it's going to continue to be funded this fiscal year, and it is increased by 15%. In the CCPD budget, what falls under neighborhood crime prevention? Neighborhood crime prevention, the, the funding initiative? I don't know. That was the question. <laughs> and it might have come in before you covered that part. Yeah. Okay, so this has um, all our volunteer programs are uh, highlighted under the Code Blue program. That is our Citizens on, on Patrol volunteers. That is our uh, Ministers Against Crime volunteers, our Clergy and Police Alliance, our Community Emergency Response Teams. They are all citizen volunteers that devote their time and efforts to the police department to help prepare for emergencies, to help fight crime, and... Um, to help uh, improve relationships between the department and the community. Uh, crime prevention unit is just exactly what it says. We have crime prevention specialists that, that interact with the community. Uh, they go to neighborhood association meetings, homeowner association meetings. Uh, they're the ones who are out there doing the kid ID and the crime prevention tips, the uh, crime prevention through environmental design uh, surveys to see if there's ways to improve security around businesses or residential areas. Uh, the NPO program is the Neighborhood Policing Officer Program. Uh, every beat in the city, with very few exceptions, has their own neighborhood police officer. That individual is not subject to calls for service, uh, but instead is more of a beat uh, organizer, beat coordinator, and is there to solve some of the routine problems uh, that occur on a beat. Uh, whether it's neighbor, neighbors disputing with each other, uh, street lights out, um, you know, broken windows theory, addressing those issues on the beat that may invite crime. Patrol support program is basically it is maintenance for the patrol facilities and some overtime. Police storefront program is just that. We have several storefronts throughout the city where officers uh, can go spend some time. They're not the police sectors, but they're actually out in the community. Um, typically, we don't pay for these except for uh, a little bit of utilities. It's usually the, the locations where these are staffed. Um, those locations open up the area to us and pay for the, uh, the don't charge us rent to be there. And then the uh, community programs, uh, CIT, HOPE, and uh, community service professionals are the, just the, uh, those individuals that we are moving into the CCPD, those programs we've talked about. Um, are the officers who respond to mental health calls degreed in social work, or are they police officers first with a little extra training? Yes, they are police officers. Um, that's why we staff them with somebody up, up service provider that is trained and can take the lead on those calls. Um, what specifically falls under the category community-based programs? The, the community-based programs are the ones that are open for solicitation, that we put out a solicitation and say, if you want CCPD funding, you can apply for it. And so um, I don't have the list of this year's funded programs, but there are five of them that were funded. Um, at different dollar amounts. Uh, there were four additional ones that were not funded. However, with this increase, we're going to be able to provide at least partial funding for them. And then we will have another solicitation probably in January of this year where um, other programs can apply for CCPD funding. And that's the category that went from 250000 to just over $2 million. How can people find out information about the grant RFP and what determines the amount that's funded? Okay, so 
we will put out a solicitation for that. Uh, we will put out the RFP. Uh, I believe we are scheduled for an October release uh, with evaluations occurring in November, December, and the program starting in January. Um, the funding amount is based on the need of the program. The people responding to the RFP, they make the ask. Um, we do believe there are gonna be caps on it because we wanna be able to be fair and not give all the funding to one particular program. And we will not always be able to fund, and we have not always been able to fund to the degree that people or organizations have asked for, but we are able to provide um, that supplemental uh, money for those organizations to start up. And sometimes we can fund exactly what they're asking. That's all the questions I've gotten. Well, we have no more questions, and uh, unless somebody here has something they want to question they'd like to ask, if not, uh, I want to say thank you all for uh, spending your evening with us, and we, uh, we are ho hosting uh, meetings through the 22nd, and so it does not have to be your district meeting. All of the meetings are open to the public. Uh, they are coming to you in lots of different ways, uh, but we want you to uh, stay engaged and send us your questions, and you can always email our offices or call our offices because while many of us are working remotely, we are still working. Uh, so thank you all, and we'll see you soon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and wear your masks.